Hello, I'm Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Good afternoon and welcome to this important conversation on the ethics and politics of Guantanamo Bay, particularly focused on the moral challenges of the United States having such a place, the obstacles to closing it, and the political costs of keeping it open. We're excited to be hosting this event in collaboration with our partners at the Pulitzer Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the event page at the Berkeley Center's website very soon. If you registered, you'll also receive an email with the video when it becomes available. We're honored to have Karen Greenberg serving as our moderator today. She is the director of the Center on National Security at Fordham University School of Law and author of The Least Worst Place, Guantanamo's First 100 Days, among many other publications. We're honored to be joined by our discussants, Carol Rosenberg and John Kirby. John Kirby is a retired US Navy Rear Admiral who is now a CNN military and diplomatic analyst and an adjunct lecturer in Georgetown's journalism program. Prior to joining CNN, Mr. Kirby served as spokesperson for the US De State Department and as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Public Affairs at the Pentagon. Carol Rosenberg has been reporting on the US base and prison at Guantanamo Bay since 2002. In 2019, she joined the New York Times as a senior journalist to continue reporting from Guantanamo. Her coverage has received the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award and the ABA Silver Gavel, among many other honors. Full biographies of all of today's speakers can be found on the Berkeley Center website on the event page. As a final reminder, please submit any questions by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom, Zoom screen and typing in your question. Karen will integrate these questions into the conversation, particularly towards the end of today's discussion. With that, I will hand it over to Karen to begin. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the Berkeley Center for hosting this panel, which I am very excited about. This fall marks the 19th anniversary of the plans to open up Guantanamo Bay, which opened in January of 2002. Since then, um, as Carol Rosenberg, who will speak soon, uh, has labeled it as become a forever prison, we're forever prisoners in the forever war. And I guess today we're gonna to talk about where we are at Guantanamo now. Let me refresh your memory a little bit. There were, have been a total of 780 prisoners at Guantanamo. There are now 40. What will happen with Guantanamo? We don't know. President Obama tried to close it. He issued an executive order on the first day of his presidency um, uh, declaring that it would be closed. President Trump revoked that order uh, in January of 2018. Um, and so we really don't know where we are. We also have the issue of the 9-11 trial. The co-conspirators, the five co-conspirators held at Guantanamo Bay, who ostensibly will be facing trial sometime in the future. Their uh, hearings before their trial have been going on and on. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today and what, that, what future they may face. Um, one thing about Guantanamo that's been true from the beginning it's been very hard to know what goes on there with the exception of a few voices. And the most prominent among those voices, the eyes and ears of Guantanamo for all of us have been Carol Rosenberg, who as Michael said, started at the Miami Herald, transferred to the um, New York Times, but has really been the person who's been there from actually before day one until now. And rather than go through the whole history of Guantanamo, I would like to focus today on where we are. Where do we stand at Guantanamo? Carol, you recently wrote about how you expected this to be the busiest year um, you'd seen in a long time at Guantanamo, and you were geared up for being there a lot of the time. And now Guantanamo is, as you've said uh, in your writing, somewhat like it was before we even opened the detention facility there in 2002. Tell us where we are now at Guantanamo. Guantanamo today is among the most isolated it has been in the course of its housing the prisoners in the prison. It is uh, 
much, the court is at a standstill. We haven't had hearings since February. It is grappling with how to make sure that the COVID-19 virus doesn't infect the residents. As a reminder, there are 6,000 people living on this Navy base, 40 of them prisoners, but sailors and their families and contractors and builders and people who run the airstrip and the sea strip. And it is a vibrant, somewhat functioning Navy base in the US Navy. And so there are also approximately 1,500 army troops that come and go to manage that prison and work at it. So the preoccupation of the moment is how to maintain that um, rotation of guards and maintain the prison and keep the virus out. So as a result, as you mentioned, the trials are on hold. What was supposed to be a very busy year of 9-11 test, uh, trial test, pretrial testimony and hearings is not happening. The last time any defense lawyer was there in early March, the last time the media was there, myself included, was late February. And I think that one could say it is also one of the least transparent times in the period of the um, of the prison, not just because reporters can't go there, which is an important element of it, but because they're not at this point participating in public affairs in answering questions. They have um, outsourced all questions and answers essentially to the Southern Command, which is the Pentagon subsidiary in Miami that runs uh, Southcom. And I think if there was one way to describe it at this moment, people are watching and waiting for a vaccine, a plan to get down there safely, and the outcome of these elections. Because as we know, and I think the Admiral can explain as best as anyone, Guantanamo is a political hot potato, whether it deserves to be or not, and whether these elections could be the future of Guantanamo prison, but the base is essentially there probably forever. Admiral Kirby, Carol gave you the perfect intro. Um, you were there as the spokesperson. You were in Washington as the spokesperson for Guantanamo. Uh, you worked for the Secretary of Defense. You worked with the Secretary of State. Um, can you tell us a little bit in terms of transparency, what the challenges were of having to face the public and face the press, given the emphasis on non-transparency that has pretty much marked Guantanamo since its opening moments? Right, and I think just real quickly, we should go back to the, the very opening when it comes to transparency, because this mission, and Carol touched on this, is it's a, a political mission, there's no question about that, but it's also, there's a national security component to it, particularly in the early days when the logic was, hey, get these guys off the battlefield so we can extract useful intelligence and prevent another 9-11. And there was a lot of fervor in that time. So um, the other thing that makes this, the transparency makes it difficult, not only is the political spectrum here uh, and the, the need to protect national security secrets, but it's the geography. I mean, this is, the, it's, it's on the island of Cuba. Uh, and it's a small base that we've been leased uh, since the war, uh, since the Spanish-American War in 1898, and it's just difficult to get to. Carol knows this better than anybody. Uh, and it's difficult once you're there; it's not easy to stay there to be facilitated there. So we have made it, uh, we have made it very difficult uh, for the press to gain the kind of access that they would normally gain for such a highly visible mission like this. We've made it physically difficult. We've made it politically difficult. And then over the course of time. As the mission fell into more and more trouble, whether it was the issue over enhanced interrogation and torture, uh, or uh, you know the the issue of uh, detainees' recidivism as we transferred them to other countries, as the issues got more complex and more political, more legal, um, there was very little incentive for the Pentagon to really be more open and transparent about what they were doing. I have to say, and I agree with, with Carol, that a real strong component. Uh, of the lack of transparency is definitely now in the political realm uh, because uh, it's been clear that this president has intended to keep the, the, the prison open and he has also uh, shepherded over uh, an era, particularly in the Pentagon, of extreme non-transparency. I mean, not just about Guantanamo, but about how many troops we have in Afghanistan and our missions in Africa. There just hasn't been a lot of transparency out of this particular Pentagon so even less incentive there at Gitmo, which was already uh, having transparency uh, problems as well. And then, of course, there's the outcome of what happens in November and the uncertainty. And it is a common rule at the Pentagon 
because I lived through many transitions there, that in the weeks before an election, uh, typically the military, and I don't begrudge them this, they tend to get a little quieter because you don't want to get drawn into political questions and political issues in advance of an election. You don't want the Pentagon to be seen as trying to put their thumb on the scale one way or the other. So they're just naturally going to pull back as it is. So there's a lot of dynamics here uh, at work that I think is making it even more difficult today to cover Guantanamo than it ever was before. Um, talking about the elections, you both mentioned the elections. And Carol, I'm going to start with you and then come to you, Admiral Kirby. Is um, what do you think in terms of the elections? Are officials talking to you? Are they telling you that that you reported that uh, the Biden campaign has said he will close it? I'm just wondering, do you think that that's something that they're going to stand behind? Are you, are you getting that feeling that they care or the fact that there's 40 prisoners there and that it's off the radar of so many people other than your readers um, that um, that that it, it may just linger in limbo for a long time without the tension needed to close it? I think there's a nuance in that the Biden campaign didn't say they would close it. They said that they learned the lesson of President Obama and did not commit to closing it, but said that it should be closed and that they believe that it should be closed. Um, and even getting that statement this campaign season was very difficult. I mean, the focus is the virus and um, domestic affairs and unrest. And so the campaign really didn't want to address it. And by the time they got to their convention, it is a subset of a phrase inside the um, platform. Uh, that Guantanamo should be closed. But the bottom line is they aren't in any way, I would say, forecasting how they would do it. And that's because, as I said, it's such a political hot potato. Um, but in contrast, you know, nobody seems to have, no, no political leader seems to have their exact way with Guantanamo because when President Trump elect, um, ran and was elected, he said he wanted to load it up with bad dudes and you know, re-energize the use of the offshore prison. And the prison he inherited had 41 prisoners and a Saudi terrorist was repatriated to Saudi Arabia during his time under a plea agreement to a um, rehabilitation center uh, after turning informant for the government in some trials. So you know, neither President Trump has been able to grow it. And as we know, um, it has not, the Democrats have not been able to close it. And the Biden campaign is really assiduously avoiding talking about and may not be internally discussing the strategy for accomplishing this. I mean, the politics of Guantanamo are, don't mention it, um, because if you propose some alternative to the status quo, you fi could find yourself being accused of being soft on terror. Um, whether or not you know the alternatives would be equally um, uh, aggressive towards the remnants of Al Qaeda, and then the other real shortly is that uh, President Trump couldn't grow it in part because of the wisdom of adding ISIS prisoners to an enterprise that was designed for Al Qaeda, and the courts and even the government having not uh, come to a conclusion on whether they are one in the same or two separate entities, which is the authority question. Admiral Kirby, let's talk a little bit about um, what Carol has referred to in terms of the difficulties of closing it, the lack of a, a plan. Um, you were there during the Obama years when there was a, a sincere intention attention to close it, or so it seemed. What happened? Congress happened, um, the, the, in a nutshell, and, and, uh, and I just, just before I get to that, I'll, I'll add that, um, that uh, while I certainly have no insight into uh, the Biden team's plans for, for shutting Gitmo down, I would add that, that he does have people around him, advisors, Tony Blinken, former Deputy Secretary of State, Avril Haines, who was a top uh, legal counsel at the National Security Council uh, in, Obama, in the Obama administration, and uh, Brian McCune, who was a top policy advisor at DOD, uh, during that time. All of them are advising him now. And so regardless of whether they have a plan or what it is, I, I don't know. But I, I can say that he does have people around him who lived through this, uh, as I did, who saw the difficulties, who know how hard it is. Um, and I'm sure that they will be at, at the appropriate time uh, working on this uh, when they can. And for us, the, the difficulty was, well, there was two, really. One, it was uh, 
internationally, if you're gonna repatriate them, where are you going to repatriate them to? Now we found 30 some odd countries uh, overall that would take uh, some, of these, uh, some of these detainees. Um, and then the other issue was of course Congress because what, uh, what we really wanted to do, what President Obama really wanted to do was get uh, a small number of these detainees uh, transferred to prisons in the United States, whether military prisons or supermax prisons, South Carolina, Illinois, Fort Leavenworth. Um, and there was a lot of not in my backyard, uh, bipartisan not in my backyard in Congress in terms of refusing uh, to even consider uh, the movement of even a small number of these de detainees to American soil, even though we convincingly, I think, proved the case uh, that it was not only safe to have them there, but cheaper for the American taxpayers over 10 years, I think, we, we estimated we'd be saving $300 million to take them off the island and put them a small number, put them uh, in the United States. Uh, one of the other difficulties, and, and this, should, should there be an effort to uh, repatriate or transfer to other countries, some of these detainees going forward, the 40 that are left, uh, is the security protocols and the agreements uh, that you have to establish with those third party countries. And, and that was, I mean, it was a, a lot of interagency work that went into this before any detainee was transferred. DOJ had to sign in, DHS had to sign on, not just uh, uh, DOD, of course, the joint, the joint staff, um, of course, the White House, all had to agree on, on the security protocols for each de detainee. And, and each, this is where it gets tricky, is each detainee had a different set of security protocols based on our, the intelligence estimate about who they were and what their likely recidivism would be. And you had to also factor in specific protocols physically, geographically, depending on what country they were going to. Senegal is a different environment than Serbia. Both of them accepted detainees, but we had to work through the geographic physical components of how these individuals were not gonna be able to travel, what their movements were gonna be like, how are they gonna be monitored? How was the United States gonna be kept in form of, of uh, local intelligence estimates about what they were doing? Very, very intricate. So it's difficult. And it's a long answer to a very good question. What happened? A lot happened to try to make this work, but, but it was painstaking. It was absolutely painstaking. Carol, do you want to add to that in terms of what, what you, from your perch, see as lessons learned from the failure to actually close it under Obama? I wanted to, yes, but I wanted to add the point that in addition to all those security protocols, because these men had been held as they say, off the battlefield, but in, these, in this detention setting for so many years, part of the repatriation and resettlement uh, challenge was that of like a social worker, how to make sure that they could be uh, rejoin mm -hmm. society, whether or not they were rightfully or wrongfully mm -hmm. at Gitmo, because most of those people were never charged with crimes and were never accused mm -hmm. of crimes, how to help them move on with their lives. Mm -hmm. So part of what the Department of State was doing in negotiating transfer deals was mm -hmm. trying to arrange case by case the best opportunities for these men to, and, and by the time everybody left, they were men, the young kids, the boys were gone in the early years, um, it, how to give them the best opportunity to be productive, be successful, not be you know angry and resentful and return to whatever angers they had while they were prisoners. And so it, it was a double challenge. But the other part of the closing issue is, and, and the Admiral makes a very important point, for the Obama administration, closing Guantanamo meant moving Guantanamo. It meant picking up some detainees, as he said, a small number, and relocating them to US soil, not eliminating the concept of Guantanamo detention for some of them. And so the Congress did thwart it. But the other issue is there is a number, there are a number of people there, 10, who they have wanted to put into trials, six of them in capital trials. And there's a, I don't know if it's a national consensus, but at this point they are facing trials through military commissions, which is a court that was created in the aftermath of 9-11 to accommodate for the period when the men were in the CIA black sites and tortured, and how to have a trial that um, somehow manages the taint and experience of what the CIA did to these men to get intelligence, right or wrong, um, and, and find a way to give them trials. Um, and as long as there's military commissions trials, it seems like there is a consensus that they should take place at Guantanamo. 
they could take place on U.S. soil, but mm -hmm. nobody's quite interested in, in doing that. There, um, so the issue becomes for the few that need to be tried, where to try them and how to try them. And whether or not, you know, the Obama administration wanted to put the five men accused of the 9-11 attacks on trial in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, the Attorney General Eric Holder described the vision and then people said it would be too expensive to secure, the, uh, too complicated for traffic, um, too risky for federal judges who might be offended by the um, evidence that they see of what happened on their way to courts for many years. Um, too dangerous putting a target on New York City for Al Qaeda as though that hadn't already happened. Um, and, and so there was there was a, a rejection of the concept of federal trials, but um, there are some who argue that because it's an existing court system, had they gone that route, these men would be convicted, and um, that the the trial of the nine the men accused of plotting the nine eleven would be behind us. What happens at Guantanamo because it's so remote, because it's so rugged, and because the court is dealing with all of these challenges involving history of what happened to these men on their way to the courthouse. Uh, we are years and years into pretrial hearings with a theoretical trial start date in this capital trial of, of June of next year, but not able to do the spade work that makes that date meaningful. Now, let me just remind everybody that, um, that there was a Guantanamo detainee who was tried in federal court, who was held in the CIA prisons, and who was tortured, and the courts dealt with the problem of the evidence and the witnesses, et cetera, and he was tried. He was convicted. He's serving time in the supermax. Um, so the, it, not to mention the hundreds of others who have um, um, been charged in the system. So, uh, you know, this is not an impossible haul. But I saw, um, Admiral, you were shaking your head yes when Carol was talking. And I just wondered, from your perspective, if, if the conversation about the federal courts is really over? Do you, do you really think it came to that moment where, which Carol observed, and I think it was accurate at the time, that we're just not going down that route, we're gonna keep them in military commissions even if they never seem to be able to happen? I don't know. I mean, I, I hope it's not over. There was a case just recently, Carol will know more about this than me, um, Ali Walla, Walla, a case I think, just, a, just a, that there was a, a, a panel here in DC in the Court of Appeals, that basically argued that um, that this individual, this Guantanamo detainee, uh, doesn't deserve due process in the federal court system. Oh, hella. And he, he's yeah. not entitled to that. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, hella. Yeah. Oh, hella. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for getting that wrong. But but that's a very but but that's a very recent example. And and I, I'm not smart enough. I'm not a lawyer to know whether that's a death blow to this idea. But it certainly is a setback to this idea. Um, and, but I, I think Carol perfectly characterizes, characterized where we were in the Obama administration, which was, and Obama, you know, we started the military commissions back in, I think, 2009, um, even while he was committed to trying to get some of those cases done in the, in the federal courts. Uh, because again, it was, it was in President Obama's mind, sort of going back to our core values here uh, about what we stand for as a country and our rule of law and the ability the credibility that comes uh, from trying these individuals in our own court systems on our own territory. And I think, you know, for all the tangible stuff we can talk about Guantanamo Bay, we shouldn't ever forget the values piece of this and what that says about who we are as a country. So uh, to answer your question, I, I don't know, but I sure hope not that, that, this, is the, that this is the death of that, pro of that process or, that, or the possibility for that process. Let me just push you a little bit on this. Um, the values piece of it, what the, which values are you referring to? The fact that we have federal courts, the fact that we give due process, the fact that we don't detain people indefinitely, was there, was it all of that? Was it more? All of the above. I mean, I think, I think I, but, but I was specifically talking about uh, the value of rule of law uh, in this country and, and what we're supposed to stand for, um, you know, as the world's most advanced democracy in terms of the judicial process and its fairness um, and our confidence in it. I mean, the other thing that 
struck me back then was all the counter arguments to bringing these guys to New York was it, it, it almost said, it almost showed the world that we weren't confident in our own system for all the reasons that Carol said that they, you know, that about safety and security and this, and I mean, that just, it just conveyed a, a lack of security in, in who we are and in, in these institutions, particularly our, our judicial institutions. So those, those, specifically, those are the values I'm talking. Carol, that's an, that's an interesting point. So you've known the prosecutors, the judges, the defense attorneys who have really been involved in the institution of the military commissions for the, the long run. And um, in terms of their confidence um, to do this, given that they're creating a, a structure, even as they're working towards trial, um, how do you assess their confidence and their sense of what their role is and their, the capacity to, to know what rules they're following, um, who to be accountable for, things like that? Well, I think, first of all, that the last six months or so since the virus has really dealt a blow to any sort of confidence that people had that this thing could be kept on track in a remote portion of Cuba on an old airstrip with... Um, tents and trailers and the ability to hold the trial of the century. You know, the virus is extraordinary, but there are constant challenges from health to weather um, in doing this. In terms of the evolution of military commissions, I think what you're saying is, um, Admiral mentioned Abdul Salam al-Hela, he is not charged in military commissions, but the decision that said that, uh, that's, that said that he is not entitled to due process under the constitution, illustrates what is going on right now in military commissions, which is there is still an open debate over what aspects of the Constitution apply to these men in an American court that was created after the 9-11 attacks with, in some people's mind, the presumption that they don't have them, um, that, they, that, that they don't have you know, constitutional protections. There is a wide gap between the defense and the prosecution on what they think are the rights of these men in these trials, particularly the ones where they want to execute these men as the ultimate punishment. And in the middle sits the judge, when there is a judge, to try to figure out and sort out yeah. which, how to protect the rights in, in, of, of not just the rights, frankly, of the accused, but the rights of America to have a, a just and honest trial and the rights of the of the victims to, if at all possible, find a verdict that is going to be upheld when it reaches other courts. Um, and they sit in the middle and and they struggle. They absolutely struggle. Um, this is these are military judges who are trained in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They know how to do a court martial. They're handed a new rule book and a new set of circumstances because the judges come and go. They are not the same judges since the start. They're not like federal judges who serve for life. And they try to balance their understandings. And you know, one of the things I should point out because I learned this in the, I, I knew this on one level, but I learned it more in the Alhilla decision. When they created military commissions, they didn't necessarily guarantee them the protections of the constitution, but they did write, certainly under Obama, they wrote more, uh, due process like um, protections into the military commissions. So we are in still the struggling period to figure out whether, for example, confessions that one side says was um, voluntary and the other side says was the fruit of torture are admissible in these trials. Um, those are fundamentally underpinned by the whole questions of due process and and the rights to have attorneys and the rights to not be tortured and the, and the, and the rights to not be coerced. And so, actually I forgot the question, but the bottom line is the military commissions are still a work in progress. And anyone who says otherwise, I think, hasn't been following what's been going on for years. I think it's also a great microcosm too of the, I mean, uh, that, of the uniqueness of this mission for the military. I mean, uh, yes, the, the military has a long history of uh, uh, you know, detaining POWs in, in time of war. I, I live not two miles from Fort Hunt, which in World War II was used to house uh, uh, German prisoners of war from World War II. So we, we know how to do this uh, in the short term. We've never had to do it for this long, th this remotely, and this tied up with uh, the legal framework, not just of this country, but of other countries. And so, and, and the mission itself, I mean, 
uh, is so inherently much more political than other typical missions that the military takes on. So, I mean, we are, Carol perfectly captured that evolution. We are still trying to learn our way through this. And, and I think the military was very much uh, in favor of the Obama administration's efforts to try to get some of this uh, done ashore here in the United States uh, because there was, a, there was a knowledge that, uh, that we're still struggling to figure it all out. One of our um, uh, listeners, watchers, <laughs> uh, Lisa Hajar has asked a question that, that I think fits right here, which is, um, do you think that given COVID and the challenges that COVID has put on Guantanamo and on the military commissions themselves, that there might be some kind of plea bargain made because just of circumstances, if not because of all the legalities that we've been dealing with over the years? And I tacked on a little to her question, so she's not responsible for any hiccups. Carol, what do you think? There was, there was an effort um, earlier to uh, get a plea agreement in the 9-11 um, in, in, in trial, but the, I, would, I would say that at this moment, more than ever, Admiral Kirby's uh, description of you don't do anything in a campaign season to <laughs> affect the outcome of it would apply particularly to the concept of negotiating a plea deal. But it would be a hard reach. You would have to actually have to figure out how to get the support of a number of, of, of players in government, even though one person entitled the convening authority has the unilateral power to make this deal. The reality is, is, is what it means is a plea deal in the death penalty case means no possibility of a death penalty. And, and, and Carol, wouldn't that, wouldn't that also be I mean, given the fact that there's been what so few cases of COVID down there, I think what only two, I mean, they've done a fairly good job of containing the virus down there. Wouldn't that also be an argument against any sort of a plea deal to sort of, you know, to help depopulate the, uh, the prison? Well, I think the plea, I think the plea deal would be negotiated up here anyways, and, and then they'd have to go down and, um, and see if the prisoners, you know, go along with it. But the, the original talks would start up here. But, you know, those prisoners, they've shut down access. The lawyers can go, but the, it's so arduous and involves two weeks of lockdown inside of barracks and the uncertainty of whether the prisoners are willing to come to meetings because they aren't fully aware of the COVID situation. Uh -huh. but, but I think the bottom line is there is no plea deal to be had uh, in a campaign season because it does require sucking it up and saying we wouldn't go for death. Now afterwards, I, don't, I, I can imagine a, either a President Trump or a President Biden at some point looking down at Guantanamo Bay and saying the process could last so long, not to sound crude, that these men could die of natural causes anyways. Perhaps there is a form of closure that would involve a, a plea and an admission of the role and the guilt to give those who aren't wedded to seeking execution, uh, quote unquote closure. But I think at this point, um, you know, as we I think the three of us agree, Guantanamo is not front of mind with anyone. It's not a, it's not a campaign issue. And you can travel the United States before COVID and tell them, uh, I tell them I covered Guantanamo Bay and, the, and people are perplexed because they think we closed it. People are not, the issue of Guantanamo is not front of mind with the majority of America. Um, I wanted to just say one thing because it's a little bit of a jag, but the topic of this uh, seminar involves the word morality. And um, uh, as a reporter who's been struggling to find out what has been going on down there since the, let's say the admirals have decided to impose a blackout on not just access, understandable at times, but information, I think the morality question of the moment is whether this is the Pentagon's prison or the Southern Command's prison or whether this is America's prison and whether America is entitled to have answers to fundamental basic questions. Uh, I'm not referring people necessarily, but I wrote an article about 
a father of a, of a NCO down there who's very concerned about the isolation of the young soldiers, not his daughter, but the young soldiers through the quarantine processes that the military has imposed. Without criticizing the fact that they have to have a quarantine, uh, Guantanamo feels very far away to the American people, the, um, those who are paying attention. Um, uh, Guantanamo feels very far away to the people who serve there, who would like to know what's going on, very far away to the lawyers. And I don't, you know, people talk about opening the aperture a little. The aperture is closed. The decision to do that predated the campaign season and is a strategy because it's effective. People don't remember that Guantanamo is there. But I think there is a, more, a morality question of whether an enterprise that has 1,500 troops and costs $13.5 million a year per detainee should be on autopilot and run by a, a no doubt quite honorable members and leaders of the military, or the public should be entitled to more answers. And this is my frustration because I'm the one who seeks the answers for the American people. This is, you know, I'm not asking these questions for my amusement. I'm asking these questions often because somebody whose child served down there has asked me the question and to see if I can get the answer. So that was a little bit of a dick, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think just to, to follow up and then we have another question, which is that, you know, one of the things you've continually tried to point out is that there are people, real people at Guantanamo Bay, not just the detainees, not just the officers, but the people who serve the detention mission and who serve the base. And so in a way, it's not that different a story, it's just this particular version of the story. And it's problematic because the deprivations at Guantanamo, which is what the story you reported basically said, are not, are not small and isolated and they, they, it's, a, it, it's like a moral quagmire on so many different levels, which is why I think you brought it up in that um, context. And, and yes, we know there's been only two cases of, of COVID, but that's because the Pentagon decided to stop reporting and making public how many positive cases have been down there. And, and in that regard, it's a concern to everybody. It's a concern to, I mean, there's, there's 2,000 Jamaicans and Filipinos serving down there as, as laborers. And their families want to know what the health condition there is as well. As do, by the way, residents of Gitmo who ask me what's going on because they are unaware. Yeah. Uh, John, did you want to uh, wait? No, the only thing I was going to say is, and I, the, the men and women down there, particularly the men and women in uniform, they are they are serving honorably. They're they're doing the job that they've been told to do, and they're doing it as professional as they can. And they are America's sons and daughters. Uh, my, my son's in the Navy. My son-in-law's in the Navy. I mean, the, 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 and while I understand election politics, and I understand that. American people are not necessarily enamored of knowing more about the, well, I, I, I get that, it's unfortunate, but I get it. But this is, th these are America's sons and daughters down there and that is American money, the taxpayer money that is funding the mission down there, which is not cheap by the way. Uh, and so you, I, would, I would hope that the American people would take a sense of ownership to, to, to Carol's question, in my view, it is America's prison. And therefore all Americans ought to care about this because they are, they are putting their, their, their literally their, their blood down there and they're, and they're putting their money down there. And I think Carol's last estimate was it was $13 million per year per prisoner, the cost at Guantanamo. Is that your? With the public figures that are available to us to do the analysis, but we know that more money is spent than that yeah. um, because it is a national, national security operation. So, I mean, that's the baseline. I, we all know it costs more than that. Um, there's a secret prison there called Camp 7 that was built with taxpayer money, and to this day we're not allowed to know who built it for how much. Um, there, there is the public figures, which are extremely costly for reasons of location and evolution and staffing. You know, this is, a, it, it, it's an irregular staff. It's not like, you know, a base where people come in and move in for three years. Everybody comes in and moves in for three years and you can stabilize it with housing. There's a constant churn and rotation of guard force going down there. Um, I, I know of two turnovers, three since uh, the COVID began, and that's expensive. These are unaccompanied troops who need to be fed, housed, amused, get health care, uh, trained, and that is an expensive proposition. And everything arrives there by barge or refrigerator flight, and that is an expensive proposition. 
there's a balance to be struck here. I mean, there, there, obviously, uh, as a former uniformed officer, I'm aware that there's there, there's some lack of transparency which is needed for national security purposes. I'm not at all suggesting that everything should be open, but to the degree that they can be transparent, they obviously should. And I worry that unless there's external pressure put on them in the military, that's just not going to happen. And we've seen uh, We've seen transparency, particularly over the last three, three and a half years at the Pentagon, and again, across a broad range of missions, uh, shut down and clamped down. And there's been, even though Congress has pushed back, there's just been very little pressure, certainly none from the White House, to get the Pentagon to open up. And if, unless the American people make this a priority and, and push for it, uh, I, don't, I just don't see it happening. Well, we have a question that follows right from that. Um, it's from Dan Norland. I'm going to read it. It seems that the American public writ large has stopped paying a lot of attention to this issue, even though it's being masterfully reported on. Thank you. If more people had paid more attention, do you think it would make a meaningful difference? Do you think it would make a difference if there was a way to sort of make people focus on it, get even more stories out there, maybe get some films out there, which I know there's at least one in the works. Do you, do you think that's going to make a difference or do you think it's really we've moved on from this moment? Certainly the price tag, if people thought about the price tag, I think that people might think hard about why we're doing it. Um, but it, in, the, in the scheme of things, at a time when people are more and more uh, concerned about their social isolation and the politics of the moment, it is hard to make people um, care. But again, tens of thousands of, of troops have gone through there um, in the National Guard. And so there, is, there, is a, there are a lot of people who know Gu Guantanamo, the good, the bad, the indifferent, and the problem. The problem is, 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 is nobody, including George Bush, ever intended for this prison to be holding people in, uh, all these years later. They didn't, when they started, they didn't know how they were gonna get out of it. But you know, this is the forever prison at this point because the people who were most likely to get federal trials and be put into federal prison were carried off to the black sites. And, and I mean, there are other prisoners down there who are more like classic prisoners of war and um, could theoretically be returned to their countries without trial because again, 30 of them aren't tried and five of them have been cleared in one fashion or another to leave. So what happened under the um, current administration is they dismantled the operation that was looking for ways to relocate people. Um, uh, but I think it's hard to make people care. I think it's hard. Yeah, um, uh, um, Admiral Kirby, I, you know, you were there during some of these d discussions. Um, Carol's referred a couple of times to sort of how, how long they've been there and they're aging. And, yeah. you know, my question is, did, did that come up, that issue that you're going to need more hospital care, you're going to need more? Sure. And, 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 and can sure you talk did. a little bit about those discussions? Because it's, it, it's pervasive and it's important. Yes. I mean, it all gets to the, the humanity of the, of the mission itself and the responsibilities that the United States military has under the Geneva Conventions for humane treatment of, of these detainees, whether you call them POWs or unlawful enemy combatants, we still had legal responsibilities um, for their welfare. And it has um, presented some very uh, unique dilemmas. I mean, the, remember the hunger strike of uh, 2000, 2013 um, and the idea of, of force feeding and the how that, that had to go to, you know, a, a legal decision uh, about what the responsibilities and what the requirements were to, to forcibly uh, put uh, nutrients into these individuals. And then I think we had, uh, uh, there was at least one detainee that I'm aware of that died of cancer. Um, and that, that opened up some legitimate questions about what are our responsibilities in, in terms of, particularly when you know somebody is terminal or getting to the end you know, is there more you can do other than just adequate care? Um, is, there, is there a hum, humane uh, argument to be made that maybe then they should be repatriated? Let them, let them die at home with family and friends and that. And, and, and so all the, those, those questions have arisen. They, they absolutely have. And we have wrestled with them. Uh, but then, you know, you get through it and nobody cares anymore. And it just kind of falls to the wayside. And it's never really taken up again as a larger systemic question to be dealt with. 
Yeah, Carol, did you want to add anything? There's a very important case working its way through the courts right now um, for a detainee there who is not charged with the crime, who is mentally ill by medical evaluation, both inside the military and out, in Muhammad al Qatani. And um, the question is uh, a court has ordered that a neutral board, including two foreign doctors, go down there and evaluate him and evaluate the Guantanamo facilities to see if this is the best place or if they are able to give him adequate care there. Um, it's called a mixed medical commission and it comes from the Geneva Conventions and it's been used in different settings to get a sick soldier home, to get a sick, and I'm not talking I'm not talking about only Americans, but it, you know this is this is a this is a this is a, a system, a global system, which would uh, have um, the doctors go down there and evaluate him. He's Saudi, and the family appears to want to get him to a mental health facility in Saudi where he would be cared for, and it would involve, I believe, some of these uh, discussions about you know guarantees for safety and security and the unspoken issue of does he ever get a passport again kind of thing. But um, whether the case of Mohammed al Qatani, there are other people down there who are sick and let's say aging out of um, mm -hmm. the ability to do active duty um, who might be eligible for that kind of a medical repatriation. But the Pentagon does not want to allow that panel down there. The idea that the Pentagon would accept foreign doctors, neutral doctors, Swiss doctors, to look over the sh shoulder of me military medical care and make a judgment is anathema to the Department of Defense across all of the administrations. So this is an, a, an important issue and a tough issue. Um, but but uh, I also wanted to point out, because the question popped up, nine people have died in Guantanamo Bay. There is a cemetery there marked and cleared for, that's empty in the case someone Muslim does die and gets Muslim burial rights. But um, in each of those instances, and with great effort in some instances involving the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, all those nine remains were repatriated to their countries, Afghanistan, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, um, that's all. Um, and. Uh, there, one can anticipate more of this. I mean, there's yeah. only 40 prisoners there, but they're aging out and there's real sickness down there. I mean, the oldest is 73 and has a heart condition. You know, you mentioned the ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and you remember in the early days how getting them there was not the Pentagon's first choice. And it was, it was kind of a surreptitious battle that eventually got them there. Is it the fact that they're not there anymore now because of COVID? Has it returned to that state? And is there any sense of when they might return or just not until further? They have canceled, you know, the Red Cross makes four quarterly visits under right. their uh, constant arrangement regularly. In addition to if someone is about to be released or repatriated, the Red Cross goes down and talks to them across the table to make sure that they actually want to go where they're going. And this is in the case of Raful Mott. So the um, Red Cross has missed two quarterly rounds of sitting across the table from detainees, hearing what they have to say because of the COVID and because the, the delegation would come from around the world off of different airplanes. They've said it's just too, too you know, risky health-wise. Um, they would have to go through two weeks of quarantine without contact with each other or anyone else because of the you know, the Pentagon theory of restriction of movement for two weeks should rub up the possibility of passing COVID, even if you're asymptomatic. But um, the, the function of the Red Cross, which is, is um, so much more important than the media, is that they get, to speak to re they get to speak to detainees. Detainees can confidentially tell them about problems, and the Red Cross can confidentially tell the prison commander and the Pentagon about problems is a way of, of trying to resolve things that are going on. And in some instances, you know, it's, it's, it's cultural misunderstandings. You know, the rotation of the guards don't really understand necessarily, you know, what is the meaning of Ramadan despite the length of the training. Sometimes the Red Cross, you know, acquires books or, or religious uh, items for the prisoners and they, cap, they bring letters to and from the families. They've been getting the letters sent in without them being there. But the lack of Red Cross there for 
two, two for two uh, rotations uh, is 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 another profound example of the isolation of that place being left to its own devices, for better or worse. Admiral, you know, she, uh, Carol's mentioning isolation, which I think is sort of, you know, the the definition of Guantanamo, right? Um, and only more and more so. And I just wondered, in terms of the detainees, when you were there during the negotiations of, of release and trying to transfer and repatriate, et cetera, that entire um, effort, which is shut down now, um, whether or not there was a sense of communication with the detainees, with the prisoners, um, that was rather um, intense and robust because they had you had to talk there were so many pieces to put together as you described um did you see that as having an impact on the detainees themselves in terms of understanding their future understanding that there was a future and in, in terms of not those on military commissions but the for, slated for military commissions or convicted but those who are actually the the couple dozen that are waiting and just in limbo from your perspective is there a way to revive that? In addition to the five that were released officially, but not released actually, do you right. think there's a, a number more that could be released um, subsequent to now? So the, the first question, I mean, uh, I wasn't party to the exact the discussions with each detainee. My understanding was in the interagency process, uh, working with uh, the prison itself, the, the facility, uh, there were, conversations that made us feel at the Pentagon sufficiently comfortable that they understood the parameters of their release. Um, and, uh, you know, each case was unique and each one was different, but, the, the, but when Secretary Hagel signed off on it, um, he had to be made comfortable that uh, not only did the, the country they were going to understand their responsibilities, but that the detainee had sufficient understanding of his responsibilities uh, under this uh, release. So I think we tried to do that as best we could. I, I couldn't say uh, without, you know, with certainty that there weren't cases where maybe that understanding wasn't as crystal clear as it should have been. Um, and as for going forward, I mean, I, I, I do think that, you know, you got 40 of them left um, and uh, only, only a small number. And we, Carol's already talked about this. Do we know we're directly involved, uh, you know, with 9-11 or, or the USS Cole bombing? I do think there is room um, for negotiated transfers of some of those 40. Now, exactly how many and under what circumstances, I don't know. I've not studied each case individually, uh, but I do think there's, a, there's a, a path to get there. And the Obama administration tried very hard, particularly in the last year or so, yeah, to, 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 to really get down to as small a number as possible. We got down to 41. I think we would have liked to have gone further. Um, so I, I do think there's room for that. Um, but again, you have, to have, you have to have the policy will you know, coming from the White House, and you have to have the interagency uh, uh, ability to have those kinds of uh, very deliberate um, uh, and very detailed discussions on each case and what you're going to do with them. Not only, and, and this is a point that uh, I, I think is important, you also have to have the international goodwill with you. You have to have, you have to have invested in relationships around the world such that you can get countries willing to do this. And, uh, and it's difficult to see, at least right now, uh, you know, with the current occupant of the White House, that we have built up that sort of international goodwill. There are lots of allies and partners that are no longer uh, as willing to trust the United States uh, and our intentions on any number of foreign policy issues as there were, as there was before. And so regardless of who the next uh, occupant of the White House is, uh, you know, in the next five years, uh, that individual is going to be facing a deficit of goodwill and trust in the international community in our own intentions and our own abilities to handle this process. Carol, do you think that's that's the, right? Or do you think that, you know, we'll just get through this period and have, you know, better international relations? Or how does this figure for you? Well, what I was going to say is um, that when Admiral Kirby was the spokesman for the Department of State, not far from his office, as I recall navigating that building, was the office of the special envoy for the closure of Guantanamo. They didn't need to have that title, but it was a group of, of very committed men and women who were mm -hmm. you know, out and about trying to fashion these arrangements to get people safely out of Guantanamo into the next phases of their lives. And what they did at times was actually heroic because you know, going abroad and convincing people to take people who we will not take onto our own soil is, is really a daunting task, 
but that office was closed. And so there really isn't any current uh, institution that's trying to uh, get even the people who are cleared to go home. The people for whom there were um, skeletal uh, diplomatic agreements for them to be resettled out of there. Um, so there is no will at the moment. I mean, I think we'll look for signals in whoever has the next administration about what will be done, for example, starting with the five people who are cleared. Do they stay there forever? Does, 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 does somebody from um, Algeria, in the course of a diplomatic contact, ask for their prisoner back who was cleared? Um, at this moment, no. But, you know, time marches on. I guess we all agree nothing's happening in the next two months. Well, I guess that brings me to one of my final questions, maybe not the final one, but, um, you know, I, I'm hearing from both of you this sense that Guantanamo is not going to close. Whereas if you think about what we've actually been saying, we've been saying, look, it, it's, it's just so small. It doesn't, it, it, it's taking an extraordinary amount of money, time, effort. Um, not to mention your time and effort, Carol. Is you, but seriously, is, isn't there in a way, a way to say it's time for this story to be over? And, and do you get any sense that, that this could happen or is it really just, we're now in the forever story and we're just gonna go on until, until the whatever, until the you end. You go of first, Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> well, predictions are hard, right? I mean, I, if I've left you with the impression that I, believe it's never going to close. I'm sorry, because that's not the impression that I want to believe. I, I believed very deeply in President Obama's desire to, to close it. And I, and I saw that even as when I was in, in, in the military, the, the damage it was doing to our reputation uh, in the world. Um, and so I don't think I want to ever lay my head at the, uh, down on the pillow at night and think to myself, Guantanamo was never going to close. I do agree with Carol uh, that right now it's difficult to see the way through there. I mean, it's difficult to see how that happens because even if Mr. Biden wins and he has these great advisors around him who I'm sure will work on this, he is going to face the congressional hurdle, the obstacle. He's gonna face the not in my backyard arguments and he's gonna be up against an international community that's just less likely to want to trust us. And of course, as we pointed out, no inter, no inter, interagency institution that's that's been working at this for the last three and a half years. So he's gonna to have to almost start from ground zero. So it's going to be difficult. I, I, I wish I knew the, how this ends, uh, the answer to that question, but I don't want to believe um, that it's never going to end. I just don't think that's good for us long-term as a country. You know, sometimes I think this is the first no exit strategy US military enterprise since the Vietnam War. And I guess, you know, as we draw down elsewhere, there are 1,500 troops at Guantanamo Bay, and some, and they're and they're expensive, and they're National Guard, and there may be a rethinking of where those troops should be and how they should be used. Um, the conversation may be different. Is all I can say. It may not be about domestic politics and who's more afraid of terror or the costs of holding a trial in the states or the the NIMBY uh, aspects. But it's hard to see it right now. It's just as hard to see. So if you were, and this is the last question, if you were advising Biden, and this is for each of you, and you had, there's no, oh, just close Guantanamo, but you had to tell him do one thing about Guantanamo that would send a message, one thing, what would it be? And Admiral Carroll's gonna tell you to go first, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, would, I, would go, I would go back to, the, to building out a team right now I mean, uh, while, you know, as you're beginning to think about transition, building out a team and, and, and soliciting um, members to join a team that, that can reinvigorate and restart that office at the State Department, as well as restarting an interagency discussion about uh, how to put the mechanisms back in place. Um, there's obviously a lot out of their control, for instance, public opinion, or how the, you know, how the Senate and the House uh, come out in the 2020 election, because that could dramatically change uh, their their ability to, to work through congressional and legislative hurdles, but you got to start with a team. You got to take the, the smartest people around that know how to do this, that did it, uh, you know, in the Obama administration, and start to flesh out a plan. I think now is the time to start making that plan and putting those people on the bus. 
And, and I would say piggybacking on that, give me that interview and sit me down and explain to me how you're <laughs> going to do it so I can write it. That's it. You guys, um, thank you so much. It's the forever conversation about the forever prisoner with the forever detainees. And I'm, I'm hoping that the next time we all get together, it is no longer forever, but in our past. So thank you so much. Thank you to the Berkeley Center. And, um, and thank you to the Pulitzer Center for underwriting all of this. And thank you to the Pulitzer Center. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Admiral thank Kirk. you. Thanks for having me.